A few months ago, I made a video all about 15 Marvel characters based on real people. And it was only a matter of time before I caved in to the multiple calls for a DC equivalent. What I wasn't prepared for was just how many examples there are of fictional cartoon characters in the DC universe who were inspired by non-fictional flesh people from our universe. Since the dawn of superhero comics, writers and artists have been looking to the big screen and using real-life actors, celebrities and models as the basis for their comic book characters. So I've been down the many rabbit holes, I've scoured the creator interviews and I've read a buttload of comics to bring you this look at famous faces who popped up in your favourite funny books. Hey heroes, I'm Josh from Panels to Pixels and this is 18 DC characters based on real people. Let's kick things off at the very beginning, with the birth of the modern superhero and the DC Universe as we know it. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird, it's a plane, it's Superman! First appearing in the pages of Action Comics issue 1, published in 1938, the Man of Steel was created by Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster. When designing the character, Siegel and Shuster combined multiple influences to form Superman's iconic look. In his youth, Joe Shuster was interested in fitness, and a fan of strongmen such as Sigmund Breitbart and Joseph Greenstein. The young artist collected fitness magazines and used the photographs inside as references for Superman's heroic poses. It's from these early 20th century strongmen, wrestlers and boxers that the big blue boy scout got his tight-fitting suit and trunks on the outside. Add to that a flowing red cape inspired by Roman gladiators and pulp action heroes and thus the archetypal superhero costume was born. When it came to the actual look and personality of Kal-El, Siegel and Schuster looked to the silver screen. Both men were fans of swashbuckling pictures like Robin Hood and the Mask of Zorro, so they modelled Suit's powerful stance and Devil May Cry attitude on the star of those films, Douglas Fairbanks. Meanwhile, the look of his alter ego, Clark Kent, was based on the appearance of Joe Schuster himself, as well as silent actor Harold Lloyd, and his name was a combination of the actors Clark Gable and Kent Taylor. Following on from the overwhelming success of Superman in Action Comics, DC, or National Comics Publications as they were known at the time, were keen to launch more superhero titles. In response, Bob Kane and Bill Finger created The Batman. Like Siegel and Schuster, Batman's creators were inspired by pulp action heroes of the day, but with a decidedly more moody tone. Kane and Finger drew from the tradition of detective characters such as Dick Tracy, Sherlock Holmes, Doc Savage and The Shadow, along with aristocratic heroes with dual identities like the Scarlet Pimpernel and Zorro. Meanwhile, Bill Finger devised Batman's civilian identity by combining the names of two real-world historical figures, as Finger himself explains. Bruce Wayne's first name came from Robert the Bruce, the Scottish Patriot. Wayne, being a playboy, was a man of gentry. I searched for a name that would suggest colonialism. I tried Adams, Hancock, then I thought of Mad Anthony Wayne. And just as screen actor Douglas Fairbanks had inspired the look and mannerisms of the last son of Krypton, he also served as the basis for Batman's stoic and heroic appearance. Later Batman artist David Mazzucchelli would cast American actor Gregory Peck as the world's greatest detective in the seminal Batman Year One written by Frank Miller. And this casting would stick around long enough for superhero painter Alex Ross to model an aging Bruce Wayne on Gregory Peck in the 1996 Elseworlds story Kingdom Come. But it wasn't just the Dark Knight and the Man of Steel whose appearances were modelled on real-life movie stars. Let's now take a look at some of the supporting cast of DC's World's Finest. Lois Lane, the Daily Planet star reporter and longtime love interest of Superman, was also created by Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster, first appearing in Action Comics issue 1. The character was partly inspired by Golden Age Hollywood actor Glenda Farrell specifically her portrayal of fictional reporter Torchy Blaine in a series of popular films from the 1930s. Meanwhile, artist Joe Shuster based Lois Lane's physical appearance on a woman called Joanne Carter, who had placed a classified ad in a local newspaper advertising herself as a model. Shuster hired Carter as the model for Lois Lane, and she formed the basis for the character's hairstyle and facial features. As Shuster later said about Joanne Carter, to me, she was Lois Lane. She was a great inspiration for me though. She encouraged me, she was very enthusiastic about the strip. It meant a lot to me. After modelling for Schuster every Saturday and becoming good friends with the artist, Joanne Carter would go on to marry Lois Lane co-creator Jerry Siegel in 1948. Siegel further expands on the creation of Lois Lane in this 1988 interview. My wife Joanne was Joe's original art model for Superman's girlfriend Lois Lane back in the 1930s. 
Our heroine was, of course, a working girl, whose priority was grabbing scoops. What inspired me in the creation was Glenda Farrell, the movie star who portrayed Torchy Blaine, a gutsy, beautiful, headline-hunting reporter in a series of exciting motion pictures. Because the name of the actress, Lola Lane, who also played Torchy, appealed to me, I called my character Lois Lane. Strangely, the characterization of Lois is amazingly like the real-life personality of my lovely wife. Now, of course, everybody needs a soulmate. Superman has his Lois Lane, and Batman has his maniacal clown face psychoterrorist. Debuting in Batman issue 1 in April 1940, the Joker is, of course, the arch nemesis of the Dark Knight, and one of, if not the, most iconic comic book villains ever put to print. The Clown Prince of Crime was created by Bill Finger, Bob Kane, and Jerry Robinson. And while the three men's versions of how the character was conceived differ from one another's, there are some corroborating details. Fact number one. At some point during the creation of the Joker, artist Jerry Robinson produced a Joker playing card from a deck of cards that he often kept at hand. Fact number two. Also at some point during the creation of the Joker, Bill Finger produced a book with a photograph of actor Conrad Veidt in character as Gwynplaine in the 1928 film The Man Who Laughs. We live in a society where it's impossible to know for sure in what order these events took place, and how the credit for the creation of the character should be doled out. But one thing for certain is that the ghastly grin, pallid complexion, wild eyes, and slicked back hair of Conrad Veidt's character in the movie were clearly a major influence on the Joker's final design. From one Batman rogue to another now as we look at the feline femme fatale, Catwoman. Also created by Bill Finger and Bob Kane and first appearing as The Cat in Batman issue 1, cover dated Spring 1940, Catwoman is one of the Dark Knight's most enduring enemies. As played by Michelle Pfeiffer in 1992's Batman Returns, the character scared the living shit out of me as a kid, but in like, a sexy way? Leaving me with a lifelong penchant for whip-wielding leather mummies. But that's probably more information than you asked for. In creating Catwoman, aka Selina Kyle, Bob Kane drew inspiration from multiple Hollywood actors, including Jean Harlow, Hedy Lamarr, and his cousin, Ruth Steele. But Catwoman wasn't the only Batman anti-heroine whose origins were derived from the big screen. Talia al Ghul, daughter of supervillain Ra's al Ghul, and on and off lover of Batman, was created by writer Denny O'Neill and artist Bob Brown. The character first appeared in Detective Comics issue 411, in May 1971, and was directly inspired by a character from the 1969 James Bond installment on Her Majesty's Secret Service. In the film, 007 woos, weds, and, spoiler alert, becomes the widower of Contessa Teresa Di Vincenzo, as played by Diana Rigg. Rigg was a frequent feature in my previous video about Marvel characters based on real people, having influenced the looks of Emma Frost, Jean Grey as the Black Queen, and Kate Bishop. I guess she just has a very inspiring look. Anyway, if you thought I'd talk about the ladies of Batman's life without talking about one of the most famous examples of a comic book character being based on a real person, you must be ha ha having a laugh. God, how did that end up in the final script? Harley Quinn is her name and being nuttier than squirrel shit is her game. But did you know that this Batman villain and one-time Joker junkie first appeared not in a comic book, but in Batman the Animated Series? I mean, you probably did, right? That's a fairly well-known fact at this point. But Harley Quinn was created by Paul Dini and Bruce Timm and first appeared in a 1992 episode of the show entitled Joker's Favor. What you might not know is that Harley Quinn was actually based on a roller skating jester from a dream sequence in the TV soap opera Days of Our Lives, who was played by Paul Dini's college friend Arlene Sorkin. And it wasn't just the colorful costume. Arlene Sorkin became Harleen Quinzel. And incorporating aspects of Sorkin's personality into the character, Deanie went so far as to actually have Arlene Sorkin voice her, providing Harley's iconic Brooklyn Jewish accent. Listen, I know you're enjoying the video and, you know, who could blame you? But I just want to take a minute to tell you about our superlative sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community for creative and curious people like you. Explore new skills, deepen existing passions, and most importantly, get inspired. There are literally thousands of classes on there from illustration, graphic design, animation, video editing, photography, music, and so much more. Recently, I've been getting really into toy and action figure photography because I'm a massive dweeb apparently, but the truth is I'm a very amateur photographer. So I just went straight to Skillshare and I brushed up on the fundamentals of DSLR photography with Justin Bridges. This crash course gives you everything you need to know about all that confusing stuff like shutter speed, aperture, and ISO, so that you can take the stunning professional photos you've always dreamed of. 
What I really love about Skillshare is the combination of video lessons, which are great for visual learners like me, plus the class projects that encourage you to get creative and put your new skills into practice. Skillshare is curated specifically for learning, meaning there are no ads and they're always launching new premium classes, so you can stay focused and follow wherever your creativity takes you. And the best part is it's less than $10 a month with an annual subscription. But even better than that, for a limited time only, the first 1,000 people to click the link in the description below will get a free trial of premium membership. So whether you're a beginner, a pro, a dabbler or a master, Skillshare has the tools you need to explore your creativity. Thanks, on with the show. Heading back to the golden age now to complete DC's trinity, we have, you guessed it, Diana Prince, aka Wonder Woman. The Themyscarian Princess was created by psychologist and writer William Moulton Marston, along with artist Harry G. Peter, and first appeared in All-Star Comics issue 8 in 1941. When creating this all-powerful Amazonian warrior woman, Marston drew inspiration from early feminists, as well as his wife Elizabeth and their life partner, Olive Byrne. Designing her to be the ideal love leader, Wonder Woman represented Marston's view of the kind of women who he believes should rule the world. Writing in a 1943 issue of The American Scholar, Marston states, Not even girls want to be girls, so long as our feminine archetype lacks force, strength and power. Not wanting to be girls, they don't want to be tender, submissive, peace-loving, as good women are. Women's strong qualities have become despised because of their weakness. The obvious remedy is to create a feminine character with all the strength of Superman, plus all the allure of a good and beautiful woman. William Moulton Marston was, by his own omission, a scholar in the street, but a freak in the sheets, and publicly promoted the virtues of bondage and submission. Having previously invented a blood pressure measuring apparatus that was crucial to the development of the lie detector, Marston had found that women were more honest than men in certain situations, and could work more efficiently. He incorporated this concept into the armament of Wonder Woman, by creating her lasso of truth. Meanwhile, her bracelets of submission were inspired by the Arabic protection bracelets worn by Olive Byrne, a woman with whom Marston and his wife were in a polyamorous relationship. It would be remiss of me not to talk about Captain Marvel, more commonly now known as Shazam, who, while initially published by Fawcett Comics, was procured by DC Comics through a lawsuit and integrated into the DC Universe. But that's a whole other story. First appearing in Wiz Comics issue 2, cover dated February 1940, Captain Marvel is the alter ego of Billy Batson, a young boy who, by uttering the words Shazam, can transform himself into a 6 foot 2 costume super dude. The character was created by Bill Parker and C.C. Beck, who based Captain Marvel's appearance on American actor, singer and all-round heartthrob Fred McMurray, as artist C.C. Beck explains in more detail. At that time, Fred McMurray was a very popular actor, and I used him as the basis for Captain Marvel. He had kind of a slanted forehead, wavy hair and a big chin. In other words, McMurray was a total beefcake, and it makes perfect sense that he served as the model for a character who was originally designed to be more Superman than Superman. Join me now on a voyage to the farthest reaches of space as we turn to the cosmic side of the DC Universe, and more specifically, to the members of the Green Lantern Corps. Hal Jordan, perhaps the most notable hero to bear the Green Lantern moniker, was created by writer John Broom and artist Gil Kane, and first appeared in Showcase issue 22, cover dated October 1959. Now it's long been thought that Kane based the look of Hal Jordan on actor Paul Newman, but to be honest with you, I do a lot of research for these videos, and what I found was a lot of people confidently asserting that Hal Jordan was based on Paul Newman, and no actual evidence from the creators. So I'm including it here because it's generally accepted to be true, but I'm going to slap a big old citation needed on it. One thing that I can confirm though, is that Sinestro, the arch enemy of Hal Jordan, who was also created by John Broom and Gil Kane, was based on a real life actor. First appearing in Green Lantern issue 7 in August 1961, Sinestro's distinctive pencil moustache and slicked back hair were based directly on British actor David Niven. Niven was best known for his roles in titles such as 1956's Around the World in 80 Days and 1963's The Pink Panther. Yet, as far as I know, the actor never portrayed a red-skinned alien with a five-head. That's just artistic license for you, I suppose. And finally, in the Green Lantern corner of the DCU, we have Guy Gardner. You know, the one with the pudding basin haircut and the totally tubular leather vest. Guy Gardner was also, also created by John Broom and Gil Kane, and first appeared in Green Lantern issue 59 in 1968. In his original incarnation, the character was purportedly modelled after American actor Martin Milner. Again, citation needed on that one, 
but the character was totally revamped in the 1980s by Steve Englehart and Joe Statton. Statton's design for Gardner was based on a character played by Tim Pigott-Smith in the 1984 British television series The Jewel in the Crown. Here's artist Joe Statton dishing all the deets on Guy Gardner's distinguished demeanour. At the time we were creating him, I was following a PBS series called The Jewel in the Crown, set in colonial India. A central character was a Major Ronald Merrick, played by Tim Pickett-Smith. He was a tough officer who felt he'd been denied his entitlements. I related his resentment to Guy's, and I kept him in mind for Guy's look. It's time for my favourite part in any video now, which is when I get to ramble on about the genius of Jack Kirby. I already added some DC sizzle to your Marvel stake in that other video when I talked about how Gil Kane based everybody's favourite scientific pseudo-vampire Morbius on actor Jack Palance. I peppered in the little fun fact there that Palance, and yes that is how you pronounce Palance, served as the basis for the appearance of DC villain Darkseid, who was created by Jack Kirby. But the truth is, that's only half the equation. You see, Kirby was also inspired by real-world evil dictator and all-round shitheel Adolf Hitler. Jack Kirby knew a thing or two about whopping Nazis, and in a biography of the artist titled Kirby, King of Comics, writer Mark Evanier explains that while the supreme ruler of Apocalypse's appearance was based on Jack Palance, Darkseid's personality was more closely modelled on Hitler, adding that the style and substance of this master antagonist were based on just about every power-mad tyrant Kirby had ever met or observed, with a special emphasis on Richard Milhouse Nixon. Jack Kirby was the master of pulling real-world faces, locations, vehicles, machinery, whatever it was, into his fantastical worlds to imbue his larger-than-life stories with a sense of realism. When it came to creating Mr. Miracle in 1971, Kirby based the super escape artist, real name Scott Free, on fellow comic book writer and artist Jim Steranko, who had previously performed as an illusionist and escape artist in his early 20s. Another Kirby creation who debuted in Mr. Miracle issue 4, cover dated October 1971, was Big Barda. A fellow new god and love interest of Mr. Miracle, Barda's physical appearance was based on American actor and singer Lainey Kazan, who had at the time recently caught Jack Kirby's attention by appearing topless in an issue of Playboy. But the inspiration behind Barda's relationship with Mr. Miracle came from somewhere a little closer to home. Kirby biographer Mark Evanier again explains. Jack based some of his characters, not all, on people in his life or in the news. The characterization between Scott, Mr. Miracle Free, and Barda was based largely, though with tongue in cheek, on the interplay between Kirby and his wife, Roz. And how can I talk about Jack Kirby inserting familiar faces into the pages of DC Comics without talking about Funky Flashman? This is a good one. First appearing in Mr. Miracle issue 6 in 1972, Funky Flashman is a kind of sleazy, suit and tie wearing businessman who is widely considered to be based on Stan Lee, Kirby's former collaborator at Marvel Comics. At the time, the two men who had co-created much of the Marvel Universe together were not on the best of terms, and Funky Flashman's attempts to rip off the titular hero have been interpreted as reflecting Kirby's view that Lee exploited his work at Marvel in the 1960s. Flashman even has a sidekick called Houseroy, who is ostensibly a caricature of Marvel editor and Stan Lee's right-hand man, Roy Thomas. From scathing satirization to parodies of pop stars, as we next take a look at DC's adult-oriented Vertigo imprint. John Constantine, the raincoat-wearing supernatural detective who was immortalized on screen by Keanu Reeves in a 2005 movie that is probably better than you remember, was created by Alan Moore, Rick Veach, Steve Bissett, and John Totalben. The character first appeared in 1985 as a recurring fixture in the saga of the Swamp Thing, wherein his likeness was based on musician and actor Sting. Artists Steve Bissett and John Totalben were apparently big fans of the band The Police, and had previously drawn Sting into an earlier Swamp Thing issue as a background character. Writer Alan Moore obliged their deep desire to draw the English musician by creating a recurring character with Sting's face, and the earlier background character that they'd drawn was retconned to be this character, John Constantine. Constantine was initially created, as Alan Moore put it at the 1984 San Diego Comic-Con, purely to get Sting into the story. But Moore went on to say that it's turning into something more than that now. More 80s pop stars worked their way into the pages of Vertigo Comics over in Neil Gaiman's flagship title, The Sandman. Lucifer Morningstar is the DC Universe's version of Lucifer, the biblical fallen angel and devil of Christianity and his appearance was based on singer, actor, writer, artist, and gender-bending alien icon David Bowie. This version of Lucifer first appeared in Sandman issue 4 in April 1989, and was created by Neil Gaiman along with artists Sam Keith and Mike Dringenberg. 
It was at Gaiman's request that the character be modelled after the art pop superstar. And this is 80s Let's Dance era Bowie we're talking about here, with the sharp suits and peroxide blonde hair. What a look. Okay, and finally, continuing the theme, we have one last instance of a chart-topping singer-songwriter working their way into Neil Gaiman's The Sandman. Delirium is one of several mystical beings who make up The Endless, a group who represent the most powerful forces of the DC universe. Delirium is usually depicted as a young girl with wild, multicoloured hair and a punky style, and while she wasn't initially based on a real person, her later Sandman appearances were inspired by singer Tori Amos. Amos and Neil Gaiman became friends in the early 1990s, and it was around this time that the pop star began to shape the depiction of the character. As Gaiman explains in a 2013 interview, Tori seemed like a fairy to me. She was this little red-headed imp who reminded me of Delirium, a character in one of my comics. Delirium always says exactly what's in her head, relevant or not, but she ends up saying very true and important things. Very Tori. Tori Amos even went on to release a B-side single in 1996 called Sister Named Desire, which was a reference to Delirium's androgynous sibling Desire in the pages of The Sandman. That was just a little pop fact for you there because I'm a massive music nerd. And there you have it, 18, count them, 18 DC characters based on real people. Thanks for watching this video, and thanks also to those who support the channel on Patreon, over at patreon.com slash panels to pixels. I want to give a special shout out to Jason Langston, who is the latest person to sign up at the return of the Sinister Six level. Thanks Jason, you rock man. Make sure to subscribe to Panels to Pixels to see more stuff like this. Leave a like, drop me a comment, follow me on Twitter, at Panels to Pixels. I post a lot of dumb comic book things on there, and you know, it's generally a good time. We have fun, I think. Take care of yourselves, and I will see you in the next video. Bye-bye.